Ah, that's good. Now we've got uh, we got rid of Gilliam's dreadfully expensive Crimson Permanent Assurance film. We get on with the main film. Ah, this is what people have come to see. Mm, I love this moment, you know, when the, get the Universal logo coming up. It's so exciting, isn't it? His working title of the film was uh, a fish film for a long time. It took quite a bit making these fish. We had to wear these headpieces that uh, had been created to fit behind us. And then we were all dressed in blue and walked up and down and around on this uh, blue uh, blue dais at different heights. And then it all had to be cut out like that. Yeah. But, it, of course, this would be much easier to do nowadays. And you wouldn't get all this breakup. Uh, that's Terry Gilliam and me coming in there. Not much. Just asking what's new. Yeah. Hey, look. How it's being eaten. You see? Makes you think, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, what's it all about? Fast and Furious. It takes a lot of viewings to take it all in. Uh, sometimes even simple little jokes of erections and all, you don't take in the first time. But maybe that's, again, a good thing about the film. It'll last forever because you'll have to keep watching it again and again. You can slow it down on your DVD and watch in detail what might have been better at half the speed that I shot it. What's the point of all these hoaxes? Terry's balloon man walking through the wilderness of tits. Some absolutely classic Gilliam cartoon. This is just wonderful. These houses landing it used to be the houses outside of my flat in North London. This is probably the best bit of the animation in the whole film. I did concentrate quite a bit on this and I let the other let fade away. Some way there, I think it was shot sort of prefigures Brazil. Anyway, what does it mean? It's got to have some meaning to it, doesn't it? Ah, <laughs> oh, there's Venus. Oh, there's the wind blowing her. And then out of this rises some sort of Eastern Buddhist nonsense going on. We're mixing religions, we're mixing philosophies. We've got. Television watchers, the, the true religion of our day. Just totally inspired animation. <laughs> Why is he melting? What goes on here? <laughs> the difficult thing with this animation is we actually were using not just cutout animation, but we were using full frame animation. The age of cloning. Before Dolly the Sheep. For a change, it will all be made clear. For this. Is the meaning of life. So the la vie. This is the meaning of life. Yeah, look at television. I'm watching television here. I feel good at home now. I don't feel I should be out in the cinema watching this. It's just perfect for my little teeny screen at home. Now this scene, the hospital scene, uh, of course this used to be the start of the film. One of the sad things about putting the Crimson Permanent Assurance film first is that the reactions to this scene was never, were never quite as good as they were when, when we started off with this scene. This scene always seems, coming after the Crimson Permanent Assurance, because there's been so much noise and everything, it's, uh, uh, this scene always seems a little bit down, because it was always designed as the start of the film. But funny, much funnier than Crimson Permanent Assurance. This is the good stuff. John and Graham playing their silly game. So, well, it's bearing it there, isn't it? Yes. Yes, more apparatus, please, nurse. The EEG, the BP monitor, and the AVV. Yes, certainly, Doctor. And uh, get the machine that goes bing! And get the most expensive machines in case the administrator comes. Of course, Graham, uh, being the qualified doctor on the team was uh, our consultant for all this and he made sure that we uh, we ordered all the right equipment for the uh, operating room. Jolly good, that's better, that's much, much better. Yes, more like it. Uh, still 
something missing there. Hmm? So he knew all the names of all the different bits of uh, equipment and everything. Patient! Yes. Where's the patient? Anyone seems like patient? Ah! Oh. Here she is. In fact, just uh, about seven years before this, I suppose, my wife Alison had had uh, our daughter Sally, and uh, she'd undergone an experience very, very close to this. She'd been put on a drip to induce Sally because the hospital decided the baby had to be born on a certain date, whether it was ready or not. And so uh, Alison found herself being induced, and uh, they virtually did pull the baby out of her, just as uh, he said here, and I was there, it just felt exactly like this, sort of, the mother was the last person they really thought of, and the emphasis seemed to be on the technology of the machines. And I was uh, amazed when John and Graham wrote this sketch, I thought it, they must have been at Sally's birth as well, but it mirrored so accurately what I, what I remembered. And that's the most expensive machine in the whole hospital! <laughs> I just love the whole idea of the... Uh, patient as being the object. Very impressive, very impressive. And what are you doing this morning? It's a birth. Ah, what sort of thing is that? Well, that's when we take a new baby out of a lady's tummy. Wonderful thing you do nowadays. Ah, I see you have the machine that goes bing! Now, the ping here, we, we spend ages, Andre and I spent ages trying to find the right ping. I never quite felt we've got quite the right one. Thank you, thank you. We try to do our best. Well, do carry on. I think this says so much about what's happened to medicine, what's happened to broadcasting. The accountancy has taken over and the management has taken over. Here it comes. And frighten it. Go. And the rough toes. Show it to the mother. That's enough. Right, sedate her. Number the child. Measure it, blood type it, and isolate it. OK, show's over. A boy or a girl? Now, I think it's a little early to start imposing roles on it, don't you? Now, a word of advice. You may find that you suffer for some time a totally irrational feeling of depression. PMD, as we doctors call it. So, it's lots of happy pills for you, and you can find out all about the birth when you get home. It's available on Betamax, VHS, and Super 8. Betamax, that sort of dates the film, doesn't it, Gosh. The Miracle of Birth, Part 2. The Third World. Oh, bloody hell. Oh, get that, would you, Deirdre? That one. Now, we had a terrible job trying to find a, a place that looked like this. In fact, we didn't find a place that looked like this in the end. We had to, as you can see, we painted in the backdrop. And we found some uh, a street that was almost right. But it was terribly difficult to find, you know, the Yorkshire back streets. Linda, Michael, Evadne, Alice, Dominic and Sasha, it's your bedtime. Ah! Now, don't argue! Now, these kids were wonderful. We had to, uh, we got about 60 of them there, I think. We had to design the set so you had the staircase going up there and then going across at an angle so that you could see them everywhere. We could have, and I wanted the high sh shelf for the, uh, um, for the fat mantelpiece, so we could have children sitting up there. I just wanted the whole screen full of children. I'll sell you all for scientific experiments. No, no, that's the way it is, my loves. Blame the Catholic Church for not letting me wear one of those little rubber things. Oh, they've done some I wonderful think it's the girl on the left is the girl that does all the singing, although she doesn't sing on screen. She was the actual... She was the voice. When we had the children in, there were 60 of them, and they all had to have permission from their parents and everything. And when he got some of the rude stuff, like when Mike says, if the Roman Catholic Church only let me wear one of those little rubber things on the end of my cock, uh, we actually said, uh, he actually said, if they'd let me wear one of those little rubber things on the end of my sock, and then we dubbed it in later as cock. <laughs> But uh, we were quite surprised, the parents, everybody was very happy for the children to sing, every sperm is sacred, they all loved the idea. 
I do think this opening stuff is, is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I think the performances are spectacular and the, the ideas are sublime. It's a great character of Michael's, I think. He's, the song itself goes, goes from sort of through about three stages. It starts off a sort of musical recitative, and then it goes into a hymn, and then it goes into a Oliver. I don't know if you've ever done anything as, 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 a long, as long a sequence as this. It just goes on and on, building and getting better. I think this is one of my favourite bits of either, I think. And those poor little kids in the bathtub, they start getting really cold by the end of the filming. Because every sperm is sacred. <laughs> the little girl in the middle is so lovely. I tried to persuade my daughter Sally to do it, but she wouldn't. <laughs> the girl behind Mike looks so pre Raphaelite. They've all got such great faces. Though. Amazing little girl, though. But this little girl who sings now in the solo, she was so perfect. I mean, she was miming to one of the other children's voices, but she never gets it wrong. For each sperm that can't be found. <laughs> it's just great stuff. <laughs> Lumped your throat, doesn't it? <laughs> and the kids were so great. They're all just putting everything they've got into it. Oh I had a terrible job trying to sing this. I had to do it, I think it was four different takes with a different line from each take. <laughs> Again, in Cannes, it was wonderful with this audience of people all in their dinner jackets. You know, Crimson Permanent comes through and that's all jolly and nice and, and easy to take because it's visually easily understandable. And then the film started and they didn't know what to make of it. They were very confused, all went a bit restless. And then by the end of uh, Every Sperm is Sacred, I think they were applauding at that point and we had actually won them. I think this was filmed in Rochdale, which is looking up the street the other way now. Very, very hard. It was the, almost the last 19th century chop to down working class street that we could find. And mine. I wanted them to have the suspenders on and lift them all up now, which they do in fact, but they don't. I thought that was a bit too obvious. Do you like the papal discount house? Somebody, one of the poor girls, fell through one of these roofs that she was dancing on. We had Fire Eaters, and we had uh, <laughs> Paper Dragon, and Fireworks, and Flags All Nations. This was only the third take, and we couldn't believe it. We'd take all morning to get everybody made up and costumed, and then we did three takes, and we said, well, that's it. And I looked at him, and I said, yes, that's it. It's perfect. So you see my problem, little ones? I can't keep you all here any longer. Speak up! <laughs> Just I can't like that speak up the way the girl looks around. The kids look so great in this picture, in this thing. I can't get over how genuine they look. The faces look like they fit the period as well. God knows all. He'd see through such a cheap trick. What we do to ourselves, we do to him. You could have had them pulled off in an accident. <laughs> no, no, children, I know you're trying to help, but believe me, my mind's made up. I've given this long and careful thought. And it has to be medical experiments for the lot of you. Yeah, it's coming up to my favourite bit of the film, I think it's that scene with Graham and Eric as the Protestant couple. Of course, the children can be out just to keep them going through the scene. We just had them going round down the road into the next house and round and out of the back of the other. What are we, dear? 
Protestant and fiercely proud of it. Graham was just so right so in this part. Every time this is <laughs> they have to a have great a character. But it's the same with us, Harry. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we've got two children, and we've had sexual intercourse twice. That's not the point. We could have it any time we wanted. Really? Oh, yes. And what's more, because we don't believe in all that papist clap so It's quite a tough scene, oh. scene to, well, to do, because it's all just door. one shot, no, basically. No. I think we do a close-up, I mean, but we, we were trying to do it all in one take. And uh, quite papacy a lot, especially for Graham to remember. And he was really good at it. He was really on top form. What do you mean? I could, if I wanted, have sexual intercourse with you. Oh, yes, Harry. And by wearing a rubber sheath... That's just really like the difference between the interior of the Protestant's house and the... The Ooh, aridness of it, and what, what he's eating, and the, the life that was going on in the Roman Catholic house. And Eric's suppressed sexuality is just really one of the funniest things he's done, I think. He may not have realised the full significance of what he was doing. But of course, this scene was meant to run into uh, the Martin Luther sequence, which we shot, and then finally cut out of the film at the last moment. I can wear French but French as proud owners of this DVD, you can see the uh, Martin Luther scene. That are designed not only to protect, but also to enhance the stimulation of sexual congress. Have you got one? Have I got one? Uh, well, no. But I can go down the road any time I want and walk into Harry's and hold my head up high and say in a loud, steady voice, Harry, I want you to sell me a condom. In fact, today I think I'll have a French tickler, for I am a Protestant. This is Graham at his best when he's like this. Uh, he's just spectacular. And he, he and Eric, what a couple, isn't it? That's the great Protestant couple of all time. But despite the attempts of Protestants to promote the idea of sex for pleasure, children continued to multiply... So that is where the Martin Luther scene would have come. The Meaning of Life, Part 2. Growth and Learning. And this was all uh, shot up in Mill Hill. We had a big decision to make because we had to give them a school uniform and uh, their school uniform was dark black blazer. But we found when we came to dress us up as schoolboys, we looked old in dark colours. We needed a light colour, which meant we had to have light coloured blazers made for the entire school. And this cost the production a lot of money. But we had to have it. I'm not sure to say about anything here. I mean, it's all... I've changed my mind now that I watch more of the film. I think it is the best thing Python's ever done. Let us praise God. O oh Lord. Oh, you are so big. Oh, you are so big. So absolutely... I think this speaks to me of countless school assemblies and ceremonies. Gosh, we're all really impressed down here, I can tell you. Gosh, we're all really impressed down here, I can tell you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for this our dreadful toadying. And flattery. But you're so strong and well, just so super. Now, two boys have been found rubbing linseed oil into the school cormorant. Now, some of you may feel that the cormorant does not play an important part in the life of the school, but I would remind you that it was presented to us by the corporation of the town of Sudbury to commemorate Empire Day when we try to remember the names of all those from the Sudbury area who so gallantly gave their lives to keep China British. So from now on, the cormorant is strictly out of bounds. Oh, and Jenkins, apparently your mother died this morning. Chaplin? I just love that throwaway. <laughs> That's the little boy just looking up and biting his lip. <laughs> no other reaction. Michael playing his very officious little uh, Chaplin. School chaplain. Don't 
And this is the scene where we weren't really sure what it was going to work because we were all meant to be playing, you know, sort of uh, 16 year olds. And there's Eric, me, Mike, Graham, <laughs> well into our 30s at this time, trying to look like we were schoolboys still. And this is where it was so crucial was to have these light coloured blazers. You know, just sort of get away with it. He chose this uh, place at Mill Hill. It was uh, quite difficult to find a place that met up with one's concept of a classic classroom. But I like this one because it had the uh, windows on all three sides. That's the kind of piece that John loves doing when there's a whole lot of nonsense to remember. He actually loves being be able to get a, a lot of difficult stuff under his belt. Your haircut and make sure he moves your clothes down onto the lower peg for you. Now, sir... Yes, Wyma. My younger brother's going out with Dibble this weekend, sir. But I'm not having my hair cut today, sir. So do I move my clothes you down? You should listen, Wyma. It's perfectly. Well, simple. we're filming this at one stage. It, it got very overcast, and in fact, it got so dark it just looked like absolutely like night outside. We had to stop filming, though it was middle of the day. And those things you just don't expect to happen. Close onto the lower peg. Greet the visitors and report to Mr. Viney that you've had your chit signed. Now. Sex. I remember when John and Graham read this script out, this uh, scene out, I just thought it was the funniest thing. Well, had I got as far as the penis entering the vagina? Um, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Well, had I done foreplay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, well, as we all know all about foreplay, no doubt you can tell me what the purpose of... I love the idea of um, you could put anything into a classroom context and it'll become immediately boring to <laughs> the children. It's just the way it's taught. <laughs> oh, uh, was it taking your clothes off, sir? Well, and, and after that? Oh, putting them on a lower peg, sir. <laughs> The purpose of foreplay is to cause the vagina to lubricate so that the penis can penetrate more easily. Can we have a window open, please, sir? Why yes, is it that line makes me laugh? And I have no idea. Can we have a window open, please, sir? It's, it's quite a nice line that doesn't seem to have any reason for making me laugh. Now, it just does. It's did just... I do vaginal juices last week? Oh, do pay attention, Wadsworth. I know it's Friday after. Oh, watching the football, are you, boy? Right, move over there. I'm warning you. I may decide to set an exam this term. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. So just listen. Now, did I or did I not do vaginal juices? Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. yes sir. Name two ways of getting them flowing, Watson. Rubbing the clitoris, sir. <laughs> What's wrong with a kiss boy? <laughs> Why John not start brilliant performance. Nice you don't have teacher to can just kill off any subject. Give it a kiss, boy. <laughs> it's just deals with it. Suck the nipple, sir. Good, good. Well done, Wyma. Uh, striking the thigh, sir. Yes, oh, yes, sir. I suppose so. Hmm? Watching the neck. Yes, good. Niggling the earlobe, uh, kneading the buttocks, and so on and so forth. So, we have all these possibilities before we stampede towards the clitoris, Watson. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Now, all these four... And this is one of the most inspired bits of set design from our production designer, Harry Lang. I think originally we just thought we'd have a... we'd pull a bed in or something. And then he said, well, why don't we have the blackboard unfolding into a four-post bed? Well, I just thought it was an outrageous piece of design. It just seems to work terribly well. It kind of visually does what they... Ah, no, this is Pat Quinn, who is just terrific. She's a wonderful actress. And, and she was so game doing this part. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Humphrey, I hope you don't mind, but I told the Garfields we would dine with them tonight. Yes, yes, well, I suppose we must. Well, I said we'd be there by eight. Well, at least it'll give me a reason to wind up the staff meeting. Well, I know you don't like them, but I couldn't make another excuse. Well, it's just that I felt... <laughs> Why not? This is for your benefit. Would you kindly wake up? Oh, I don't know. I don't no know. intention of going through this all again. <laughs> Maybe. There was some contention about whether they should take their pants off, and I said, well, I think you should, really, because it's uh, 
appropriate is a sex lesson after all. Uh, we'll take the foreplay as read, if you don't mind it. No, of course not, Hamlet. So, the man starts by entering or mounting his good lady wife in the standard way. Uh, the penis is now, as <laughs> you will observe, more of a fact of it all. There we are. Ah, that's better. Now, Carter. Uh, Michael, do you? Yes, sir. Hey, what is the it? Just, it's... <laughs> It's so convincing, that's yeah. exactly what the goes on. Classrooms all the world over, I'm sure. The up and down <laughs> inside the vagina. So put it there, boy, put it there on the table. While the wife maximises her clitoral stimulation by the shaft of the penis by pushing forward. Thank you, dear. Now, as the sexual excitement mounts, what's funny, Biggs? Oh, nothing, sir. Oh, do please share your little joke with the rest of us. I mean, obviously, something frightfully funny is going on. No, honestly, sir. Well, as it's so funny, I think you better be selected to play for the boys' team in the rugby match against the Masters this afternoon. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> so we had a dummy in there for the masters to beat up. <laughs> what little kids. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't a muddy day, so we had to create this mud patch. <laughs> it's like a ballet of rugger. Then we sort of carefully had to do the transition into the First World War scene. We carefully lined this up so the goalpost behind that echoed in the wall there uh, with the two trees. I don't know whether anyone ever notices. And this was shot on the uh, the back lot at Boreham Wood at Elstream. And uh, it was just a little hill behind the studios up there. But, uh, we dug it all up and created this First World War battle field. It's a, a joke that we missed out of this, which I always wish we'd put in. It was that when we come over the top, first of all, I, I was supposed to say to uh, I said, Jenkins, you go and take, get the buggers on the left flank, and I'll uh, I'll get the heterosexuals on the other flank. <laughs> when we uh, did the dialogue scene here, we had explosions going off. We had, I think, because we were trying to do it in one take, we had something like 60 explosions going off in one shot, which is a phenomenal number of explosions. and. Poor George, the uh, special effects designer, was saying, you really need this number of explosions. Uh, it was quite a superhuman effort. The thing I remember most about this was that uh, in between takes, the special effects guys had to go out there and reset all of the explosions. And one guy went out there, and the one thing you don't do is carry your explosions in a plastic bag. And he walked out there, and it was still hot in certain areas. And suddenly this explosion, and it went up, and the guy got blown up. We should have shot it differently at a certain point once we got into it. We should have maybe got into the trench down so we didn't have to do the explosions anymore. We could just concentrate on, on the scene. But uh, that's not the way it was shot. It was just shot with everybody up, which is... Uh, easier to shoot but probably more time consuming because you had to constantly reset the explosions well now that is thoughtful stuff it's good man well, the special effects guy who got blown up was all right in the end and i can't remember how long he was in hospital and by god i wish i could remember his name because that kind of sacrifice deserves uh, uh memory our memory and i don't he was just a guy walking, and you sit there, and it's like you're watching a battlefield, because you've got all these craters out there, and you see this guy walking out, other other people were out doing this stuff, and he, he steps over the crowd and disappears down the crater, and suddenly, boom, huge explosion, oh my God, no. Anyway, you shouldn't have said that. that's the price you pay when you make movies. You've hurt his feelings now. Don't mind me, Splash. Toffs is all the same. One minute's all please and thank you, the next up, 
kick you in the teeth. Yeah. Oh, let's not give him the cake. I don't want any cake. Look, black it cooked especially for you, you bastard. Eric yeah, starts corpsing in this scene. Yeah, uh, but I think it's in the... I'll be all right. <laughs> black it. Black it. This is the bit where Look Eric starts corpse. He's trying to come it up. When does he go? I think he's. Starts laughing there. That's where. <laughs> he's really life. just can't and stop laughing. <laughs> and he manages to put himself <laughs> together <laughs> by the time he comes back again. <laughs> All right. We will eat the cake. They're right. It's. It's too good a cake not to eat. Get the plates and knives, Walters. Yes, sir. How many plates? Six. Five. Uh, no, better make it five. Tablecloth, sir? Yes, get the tablecloth. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll get the tablecloth. And better get the cake like table hot. Uh, and the little mat, sir. Yes. Right, sir. Oh, and while you're at it, better get a doily. I'll bring two for in case you want to crumble. OK. Well, of course, warfare isn't all fun. Right, stop that. It's all very well to laugh at the military, but when one considers the meaning of life, it is a struggle between alternative viewpoints of life itself. And without the ability to defend one's own viewpoint against other, perhaps more aggressive ideologies, then reasonableness and moderation could quite simply disappear. That is why we'll always need an army. And may God strike me down were it to be otherwise. <laughs> It's a constant attempt in the film to drag the whole thing back to the meaning of life. I remember when we first started writing Meaning of Life, the earlier ideas I always thought were going to be brilliant. I mean, we were doing Monty Python's World War III, which I thought had great potential. Everybody was wearing advertisements on their uniforms. Everything had a sponsor, like Formula One racing and, and maybe... The world is moving towards that. Well, we didn't go that direction. We had another idea, which I really loved, which was the fact that the film was on trial and we were on trial because uh, the prosecutors had said, it's not a film, it's a tax dodge. And we were going to be doing things which uh, had scenes, say one would be doing Hamlet, but we'd be doing it in um, Barbados or some tax exile that was completely inappropriate for Hamlet. And little by little, in the course of the film, the case went on. And we were at one point even going to be doing advertisements in the film. We were actually going to go and get people to take out advertising space and we would then do their ads and they would give us lots of money which would finance the film. And ultimately we were going to be found guilty and then we had to choose our method of execution. So by the end of it, each of us would have uh, died a horrible and interesting death. That was another idea that didn't go any further. And I suppose you want to go... Writing it was interesting because uh, we were down in Jamaica. And as a group, we weren't working quite in the same way as we had when we were uh, doing the television shows. In the end, there was so much material that didn't go into the film. So it was quite wondrous. But what's in there? In retrospect, when I watch the film, I, I really do find it incredible. I actually think the first parts of the film, the, first, the beginning, the uh, Catholic family, the Protestant couple, sperm song, are some of the finest things Python has ever, ever done. And I think performances in the film, I think, are as good, if not better, than anything Python has done. Well, I can't remember, was Graham alive when we did this? Now, this was shot in Glasgow, in the Campsie Fells. And uh, we got up there to shoot it, and it was uh, there was a rebellion. All the uh, the guys we got to come and uh, be our Zulu warriors uh, rebelled because it was a miserable, terrible day, and uh, it was cold and misty, wept. And honestly, the Campsie Fells didn't look like South Africa; it looked like the Campsie Fells. And then about sort of. Uh, 10 o'clock, we got word up that there'd been a revolt and they refused to put on the costumes. They said they were too flimsy. So uh, we had to abandon the shoot that day and uh, reschedule it for the next day. And we couldn't get any black actors. We had to <laughs> get white actors and had to ship down to London for tons of blacking, uh, black makeup and black wigs. The very few ethnic actors we had, we had to put in the front and then Everybody in the background is sort of just blacked up. <laughs> it just looked terrible. But the great thing was, it was a, a beautiful and sunny day the next day, and uh, suddenly it looked a little bit more like Africa. 
Pick the shreds, though. Must be a hole in the bloody mosquito net. Yeah, savage little blighters, aren't they? Excuse me, sir. Yes, Cedric. I'm afraid Perkins got rather badly bitten during the night. Well, so did we. Huh. Yes, but I do think Doctor ought to see him. Well, go and fetch him, then. I, I crease myself watching everybody in there, because everybody's doing great characters. Very, everybody had become very confident by the time we were making the film as performers. Ah, morning, Perkins. Thanks, sir. What's, uh, what's all the trouble there? Now, this is the scene that we shot on the previous day when we had the revolt of the extras. And, of course, it didn't matter that we were shooting this tent and it uh, didn't matter the fact that it was grey and horrible. John Cleves was extremely ill during this, <laughs> during this day. He kept on going outside and being sick. He'd stayed in the hotel and had he'd eaten some prawns and uh, I came in to say something to him when he was eating them and I could smell slightly off. I was just about to say, John, I wouldn't eat those while we were Then I realised he just finished eating them, so I thought there was no point in saying anything. But I wasn't surprised when I heard he'd got food poisoning that day. But he uh, manages to pull it off. He doesn't give any indication of suffering from food poisoning when he's actually acting. Is there something up? Yes, sir. During the night, old Perkins got his leg bitten sort of off. Been in the wars, have we? Yes. Any headaches? I think Eric and Graham are brilliant at this scene. And one of the reasons why they're so good is because of the costumes. They're so meticulously researched and done um, by Jim Atchison, who's won three Oscars for costumes. But just look at Eric's shirt there. It's so correctly tailored for the period. And Graham's costume and, and makeup it makes him into a period character. It's uh, meticulous costuming, brilliant stuff. Any other problems I can reassure you about? No, I'm fine. Jolly good. Well, must be off. <clears throat> so it'll uh, it'll just grow back again then, will it? I remember watching this scene. I've always felt it was a great joy because I think the acting is brilliant. I just think as you know, the group there, everybody's brilliant. It's 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 much subtler acting than Python used to do, and it's it, again what's interesting. This is all done you know in one shot. It's not full of cuts and things. It's just about really good performing. Educated guess, I'd like to make that clear. Is some it's great to be able to watch this as an outsider. <laughs> I think, you know, well, that's what they were doing while I was banging around in that other studio. They were making really good work. <laughs> A tiger. A tiger? A tiger? I think when we were working, we get so G'd up, or certainly I do, and I think Terry does, you know. And it's really hard to deal with criticism. It's, you know, one's being very defensive, protective, critical of everything. And to be able to then step back years later and look at and just see how good the work is here. It just it knocks me out. I think it's really nicely done. Again, the costumes with the helmet all hacked to pieces. It's sort of a lot of thought. Jim pays such attention to detail and he's full of ideas. It just makes a little difference, you know, the, the man coming in from outside who's all half been beaten up. I just see you guys see the cellar tape on my beard coming off on the left there. You just see the mark, the toupee tape. I never noticed that before. The MO says we can stitch it back on if we can find it immediately. Right, sir. Oh, I'll organise a party right away, sir. Well, it's hardly the time for that, is it, Sergeant? Uh, a search party. Oh, 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 much better idea. Mm -hmm. oh. We were just so lucky that the sky was blue today. I mean, at home, if you kill someone, they arrest you, eh? They give you a gun and show you what to do, sir. I mean, I'll kill 15 of those buggers, sir. Now, at home, they'd hang me. Here, they'll give me a fucking medal, sir. I love these jungles that we were able to create in, in England <laughs> on the back lot. We shipped in a huge quantity of uh, greenery and stuff. We were just shooting it in a <laughs> bit of dingle at the back of the lot. I mean, on a by stream, and we just dressed in all the tropical plants we could get hold of.
All I want to know is, what was Mike holding in his hand there? Was it a little hairbrush, a mirror, or what? These are the, the, the secrets of uh, arcane kind of filmmaking, and I don't know what it means. Uh, uh, don't shoot, don't shoot, we're not a tiger. Oh, he's got a sword now in his hand. Uh, we were just, um... Why are you dressed as a tiger? He's got it again, that thing in his hand. What is it? Oh, why? This is why? a strange why? sketch. Oh, it would seem to be us one of the funniest scenes when, when it was read out. It's got no real justification for it. It doesn't go anywhere. In fact, where it comes in the film, it seems to be a low point in the film somewhere. High spirits, you know, simple as that. Nothing more to it. What is this scene well, about? <laughs> Never quite understood. This, this japery going on. It's just like, uh-oh, we've sort of reverted back to old Python. <laughs> it's just silly. It's rather clunky looking. We, we've left some really fine work behind. <laughs> it's one of those strange exchanges where there's no justification for it whatsoever, really. It's funny, but it's sort of vaguely unsatisfactory, I suppose, because there is no explanation for why they're lying. <laughs> We're inmates of a Bengali psychiatric institution, and we escaped by making this skin out of old used cereal packets. It doesn't matter. What? Doesn't matter why they're dressed as a tiger, have they got my leg? Good thinking. Well, have you? Actually, yes. It's because we were thinking of training as taxidermists and we want to get the feel of it from the animal's point of view. Be quiet. Now look. This scene is just another just ridiculous up. idea. You've got this man's leg. I think while the rest of them are busy doing this scene, I'm being outfitted backstage in the most uncomfortable rubber suit imaginable having to be inside a Negro. It's hard work. And probably politically incorrect. Found the tiger skin in a bicycle shop in Cairo. The owner wanted it taken down to Dar es Salaam. Shut up! Now look, have you or have you not got his leg? Yes. No. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. This scene probably seemed a really good idea when it was first written. I'm not talking to you. Um... Oh. Right, search the ticket. Oh, come on. I mean, do we look like the sort of chaps who creep into a camp at night, steal into someone's tent, anaesthetize them, tissue type them, amputate a leg and run away with it? Search the ticket. What does Mike have in his hand? Leg. You're looking for a leg. Actually, <laughs> I think there is one in there somewhere. Ah, now Terry Gilliam is starring role. <laughs> the unzipping. What are we doing here? I can't remember how this came up. The zipper never worked as well as we had hoped, if you notice, it opens at the bottom. Into the middle of the film. Ah, the most unexplained bit of the film, the middle of the film. Originally we were going to have lots of stars here saying welcome to the middle of the film, but, uh, but we couldn't afford to get them in the end. We'd hoped to have Sean Connery and uh, Julie Andrews and people, but... Uh, yeah, and it's just Mike Palin. There's this strange lady. I don't know who she is. If you think you know, don't keep it to yourselves. Yell out so that all the cinema can hear you. So here we are with Find the Face. Now, the next scene was shot in, inside Battersea Power Station, believe it or not. We built this little set. It's an absolutely remarkable 1920s industrial interior uh, with this parquet flooring. And it's actually all gone now. So this is one of the few records of what Battersea Power Station looked like in its heyday. One of the great moments of Python. Wouldn't you like to know? It was a lovely little <laughs> Now, this troll that comes forward here was actually a costume we had built for um, Time Bandits, and it's used in the scene where the giant crushes um, a house. And we never saw it in close-up, so we dragged it out of, of storage and included it in this. But I do think this is Python at its surreal best. A fish, a fishy, ooh. Look at that ceiling, it's just extraordinary. Fishy, fish, <laughs> that went with it and it grew. Back to the, back to the fish. There's kind of feeling that in order for a film not to be just a sketch film, which it is, of course, there should be... I kept wanting to pull out more about the meaning of life, as if there was some point to it, as if we were actually going somewhere. 
That explains some of the cuts that we made. What do you think the next bit will be then? Caption, I expect. What about the next stage of life, you mean? Oh, yeah, here we go. Middle age. Oh, Could have guessed it. <laughs> Here we've cut a sequence. We see Mike and Eric arriving at the hotel and they go into their room and uh, they love everything. It's just a terribly ordinary room and the view out of the back is just on a roller so you can change the view to what a townscape or a landscape or whatever. But we cut that and we also cut the first scene in the restaurant which is when Carol comes on as, as a waitress. It's a pity because it's a very funny sequence, but I think on the DVD you'll be able to see it. In an authentic medieval English dungeon atmosphere. The idea of dungeon restaurant. This also doubles up as a Hawaiian restaurant. <laughs> I've always had a secret suspicion that uh, the Handys were my mother and father. They had turned up on several python shoots. <laughs> and Eric's checking through his bag, because that was part of the earlier scene. Now, we left this scene in, because it wasn't... In fact, it wasn't quite as funny as the scene with Carol in, in the beef eaters costume. But I kept it in because it was about the meaning of life. And in a way, that's why I think the, the other stuff went as well. Uh, football, you can talk about the Steelers-Bears game Saturday, or you could uh, reminisce about really great World Series. No, no, no. What is this one here? Uh, that's philosophy. Is that a sport? Uh, no, it's more of an attempt to uh, construct uh, a viable... It's the right thing to do in the end. You know, you always, you always regret that you've cut things. There you can see behind Mike, you can see one of the waitresses that, in that beef eaters costume, beautifully designed again by Jim Atchison. Philosophy for two? Right. Rum, 259. 259. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do we... Oh, uh, you folks want me to start you off? Oh, really, we'd appreciate that. Okay, yeah. well, uh, <clears throat> look, have you ever wondered... Not where sure where John like gets his waiter character from. <laughs> Well, we went to Miami last year and California the year before that. No, no, no I mean, uh, why we're here on this planet. <laughs> I just love Mike's no. character. It's just... Right. Uh, it's you so... ever wanted to know what it's all about? Nope. <laughs> Righty ho. Uh, well, uh, see, throughout history, there have been certain men and women who tried to find a solution to the mysteries of existence. <laughs> and we call these Take guys the philosophers. And that's what we're talking about. Right! Oh, that's me. Whatever happened to all these Python performers? They were so good. They are really brilliant. And they've gone on to what? I guess fame and fortune, but they're never, they've never been as good as they are here. I mean, the same between John, Eric, and, and Mike. I think they're brilliant, each one of them. And I never see them get to do that sort of thing. Evermore. Mike has got to go around the world being nice. Eric has got to live in L.A. being clever, and John has got to be in films that pay him lots of money for doing very little work. I mean, John's really good in this. Uh, there's an S in Nietzsche. Oh, well, yes, there is. Do all philosophers have an S in them? Uh, yeah, I think most of them do. Does that mean Selena Jones is a philosopher? Yeah, right, she could be. She sings about the meaning of life. Yeah, that's right. But I don't think she writes her own material. No. Oh, maybe Schopenhauer writes her material. No, Bert Bacharach writes it. But there's no S in Bert Bacharach. Or in Hal David. Who's Hal David? He writes the lyrics. Bert just writes the tunes, only now he's married to Carol Bayer Sager. A waiter, this conversation isn't very good. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we do have one today that's not on the menu. It's sort of a specialty of the house, you know? Live organ transplants. Live organ transplants? What's that? The meaning of life. Now, why we saw the picture of Heidi Slassie, I have no idea. 
But uh, there we are, we got it. Don't play this! I'll get it! <laughs> it's Terry Gilliam as Rastafarian Jew, which is rather a strange yes. construct. Hello, uh, can we have your liver? I don't know why it happens, but they gave me this small part, which I decided had to be a Jewish Rastafarian. John and Graham as a couple of desperados. Yeah, so it's reddish brown. It's sort of... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know what it is. <laughs> Terry really is a great performer. Oh, I forgot. A Jewish Rastafarian with a Hitler mustache. What's this then? I live with Donna's card. Need we say more? He's totally convincing. But... I can't give you now. It's an in the event of death. <laughs> he does these wonderful twitches, just so horrible. <laughs> it must have been, the scene was actually quite fun to do. Because it just, it was so awful. <laughs> and the, the gore is what's so great. I, I mean, I love Graham's working way. And John, John, completely distracted, <laughs> waiting for something to come into his life, it seems to me. And she does. <laughs> Terry has just given the most wonderful performance of his life here. This hand and wriggling. It's... See Graham there just reaching over to get the liver out of something else. They all go to saving lives, madam. That's what he used to say. It's all... And I think this is one of the great romances that Python has ever uh, created, the one between John and Terry. It gives a bit of hope to everybody in the world that they'll find that right person sometime, somewhere. It just helps to have no taste. <laughs> John's strange performance here, sort of abstracted. He's got sort of cotton wool in his mouth as well, sort of a la Marlon Brando. It was an absurd situation where somebody had to keep handing Graham bits of offal and organs and things, and they never seem to come out of the right place. It's like he reaches up to my shoulder and then moves an organ into place. Like <laughs> coming up. I think when Python moves into Grand Guignol, uh, uh, nobody comes close to us. <laughs> uh, you do realise uh, he has to be, uh, well, dead by the turns of the cop uh, before... <laughs> this scene <laughs> makes me crazy, because i just uh, sitting there <laughs> watching an awful Terry <laughs> with his curlers and John. I wish he'd come back to us. What are you doing after that? I mean, would he stay on your own? Or is there... Uh, Someone else, sort of, uh, it's almost the kind of the love scene that you want to avert your eyes because you don't really want to have to watch what goes on between these two. Now, my one of my favourite bits of the film coming up, uh, Eric's Galaxy Song, which I just think is one of the it's the best things he's done. It's such a lovely song. It's a great selection of, of really intelligent, <laughs> wise and funny songs. Can we have your liver then? <laughs> Scared. All right. I'll tell you what. Look, listen to this. Whenever life gets you down, Mrs. Brown, and things seem hard or tough, and people are stupid, obnoxious or daft, and you feel that you've had quite enough. <laughs> Uh, the wall collapses, but you hardly notice, really. It's a night change. And revolving at 900 miles an hour. That's orbiting at 19 miles a second. So it's reckoned a sun that is the source of all our power. The sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see are moving at a million well, This was the only verse that was meant to be shot like this. It was then meant to go on to some animation. But in fact, when we were shooting it, I said, well, let's just do the next verse as well. So that's this verse. But Eric hadn't rehearsed this one. So this verse was just, you see, look at the camera occasionally, because he hadn't actually rehearsed this. And we're just walking along sideways to the stars, which is totally not what you're meant to do. This bit was just meant to be a temporary filling. But in fact, in the end, uh, Terry never sort of... a did the rest of the animation and uh, so we had to use this bit. We go round every 200 million years 
And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in this amazing and expanding universe. Do I do some animation here? Oh, good. <laughs> he starts the animation from here, but it was meant to start the before the previous verse. But this is called proper animation. I basically drew it out, sorted it, and then gave it to some excellent people who could actually make the thing work. It's a great piece of animation there. Like worth holding it back. So like that, the, the cosmic sperm. It's a brilliant piece of animation. I was very keen to do the Big Bang Theory. So this is a uh, time-space continuum about to curve like Einstein had predicted. It's a delightful song. It's got wonderful lyrics. So remember when you're feeling very small and insecure. I keep watching John. He's really doing nothing, but he's doing everything in the background. We had to bring the sound of the fridge closing before the fridge actually closes, so that it fitted in with the rhythm of the song. Yeah. Yeah. Can we have your liver, then? Yeah, all right, you talk me into it. Eric! And the shooting style changes, folks. Now, this is where Terry Gilliam's original Pirates scene was meant to go originally. It was meant to be just a five-minute animation. That's how it started off. And then Terry gradually took over the studio next door and was shooting more elaborate stuff than we were shooting for the main film. <laughs> he went on and on. I was a bit too busy to notice, but uh, it, it, Terry sort of, Terry's piece expanded and expanded until finally it was the... 15, 17 minute piece that it is now. And when we played it originally in this position, it just didn't work. It just was too long and uh, just didn't fit in. And people were looking at the film and saying, oh yeah, it's quite a funny film, but that pirate sequence doesn't work. And then Terry said, well, he'd always thought it would work at the beginning. And he got this idea for how it would come back into the film. So that's... Um, that's what we did. We shot this bit, uh, um, and we had the return of the short film. However, this is rarely achieved owing to man's unique ability to be distracted from spiritual matters by everyday trivia. What was that about hats again? Oh, uh, people aren't wearing enough. Is this true? Well, certainly. The hat sales have increased, but not Perry Pursuers, our research but initiative. Wouldn't enough? Enough for what purpose? Can I just ask, with reference to your second point, when you say souls don't develop because people become distracted, has anyone noticed that building there before? No, this scene was going to be part of the whole permanent insurance sequence as the building comes into the, the big glass city. We were then going to cut inside to this scene, and this scene would then go on, and then we would cut outside and they would start firing and in through the window would come um, the ancient pirates. And because the film wasn't uh, sitting happily at this position, when we pulled it out, we were able to put that scene in there on its own and it, it worked really nicely. I, now I'm trying to remember, I think I shot the crushing of the building after we decided to pull it out, uh, the Crimson Permit out of the main film. And it uh, just became another way of ending that little sequence. Part six, the autumn years. Good evening. When we were going to shoot this scene, we originally, Harry, our production designer, wanted to use the same restaurant location that we had for the philosophical conversation. And I kept on saying, no, I think it's got to be bigger. I couldn't think why. And I looked at my little drawings and I saw it had it got sort of a very big restaurant on, on, on the two levels as well. Eventually I went all the way around, um, around London with Harry looking for likely looking restaurants and uh, eventually we got to the RAC club and said, yeah, it's more like this. Huge restaurant. And there. Harry said, oh, I know where we can do it. So we did it at Portland Street Barnes. What was interesting about Creosote was originally, when it was written, Terry was trying to convince me to play Creosote. Thank God I didn't, because Terry's absolutely brilliant as it. I think they, they felt confident that I could do projectile vomiting and, the, and general grotesqueness, but Terry's performance is wonderful. Now, Mr. Creosote here, I think I should have listened to Jim Atchison. Jim had designed this costume. I had a body cast for it. 
and the sculptor design, the shape and everything. And then I pushed Jim to go a little bit bigger, and I, I, don't know, I think Jim's original thoughts was right. We also had a sequence of Mr. Creosote outside the restaurant, walking along with his stomach on a pram, on a wheelbarrow, which for some reason we didn't use. But again, you can see that clip on the DVD. This scene just started. I wrote on a piece of paper a scene in the worst possible taste. I didn't know where it was going to go, and then it sort of went to a better, how are you feeling better, better get a bucket, and then it went on from there. And in fact, when Mike read the scene out uh, to the script reading. Nobody laughed. Nobody thought it was funny. And it got put on the rejects pile. And uh, we weren't going to do it. And then about a month later, John rang up and said, oh, I'll tell you a little plumber something will bring a smile to your face. Uh, I've just been reading that Mr. Creosote sketch. I think it could work rather well. But what John had realised was, was that the waiter was the funny character. <laughs> John then came up with the, uh, the wafer thin mint. A new bucket for Monsieur. Now you can see the vomit there. That one there was the from the first day shooting when instead of having it, oh now watch here, it, it, I don't open my mouth in time. Oh, is it, and it's and the vomit is coming from the other side of my face. It's not actually coming from my mouth. We found that it didn't really work because you got a shadow on the on the vomit once it started streaming. So our special effects um, guy got a, a standby thing where I had something going into my mouth, so it was actually coming out of my mouth, which was better. The vomit was made of, um, well, it was Russian salad and vegetable soup. I think we had about 90 gallons of it in a big bath on the set. And uh, as it took four days to shoot this sequence, it was fine at the beginning, but by the end of the fourth day, and under the lights and everything, the, <laughs> the Russian salad and vegetable soup was beginning to smell exactly like it looked like. It was revolting. And yet, uh, and yet, even though it was so disgusting, all the extras, everybody, we asked for volunteers to have the stuff thrown at them because we had a catapult linked up, which would shove about 15 gallons at once. Yeah. No, wait a minute, I think I could only manage six crates today. I hope Monsieur was not overdoing it last night. Shut up! D'accord. Ah, the new bucket and the cleaning woman. Now that's with the new, uh, the new system, which is actually coming from my mouth, from little tube. Now Carol is just wonderful in this scene. It's my favorite Very thing that she does. Excellent. Perhaps you're not happy with the service? No, no, no complaints. It's just that we have to go. I'm having rather a heavy period. Mm. And we have a train to catch. Oh. oh, yes, yes, of course, we have a train to catch. And I don't want to start... <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> reactions. <laughs> Madam, perhaps we should be going. <laughs> oh. Farewell, Miss I just can't imagine anyone but Carol doing that somehow. She's so... She carries off that kind of thing with such verve. Oh dear, I have trodden in Monsieur's bucket. <laughs> it was always just sort of great to get people not to react to these things, not to do terrible reactions. And again, it's, it's scenes like Creosote that really makes you feel good to be a python, to have somehow been in some small way part of <laughs> adding this to uh, the culture of the 20th century. Originally, I had a fish coming out of my mouth, but we'd had to do this about 20 times because John kept corpsing for some reason. And the, eventually I couldn't put the fish in anymore, so I had to use a bit of pineapple. Bah. Oh, sir, it's only a tiny little thin one. The oh, fuck off, I'm full. Oh, sir. Hmm? It's only a wafer thin. Yeah. I couldn't eat another thing. I'm absolutely... But this was John's inspiration, the, uh, the wafer thin mint. Just one. Just one. Just the one. Yeah. <laughs> John kept on laughing at this point. I think it was take 20 or something. So this is when he explodes. We had an inflatable body for the uh, first bit of the explosion. In fact, you never see him explode. I never thought it was going to work. You just see him blowing up. And then Julian, who's editing, just put in a couple of flash frames. And you read it as an explosion. Just look, there it is, two flash frames, and then you go to all this gunge being hurled across. This is 
Uh, the special effects man put that wonderful pumping heart in it, which is <laughs> a plus, and the dangling watch chain. <laughs> Now, Julian always had the idea to have this bit at the end of the film. The Meaning of Life, Part 6B. The Meaning of Life. You know, Maria, I sometimes wonder if we'll... Now, this is all one take from the beginning of here. It's as long as a piece of film is. I think it's about three and a half minutes. And it's just one take right from through all the uh, cleaning ladies' little poem and then going to Eric and then following Eric and then going out of the into the street with Eric and following him up the road. And it's all one take. It's quite a tour de force. But it didn't teach me nothing. I recall. And the Library of Congress, you'd have thought, would hold some key. Of course, the whole place stank by this time. And they had a wedding the next day, so I hope they got the place clean. some clue. I worked there from nine to six, read every volume through, but it didn't teach me nothing about life's mystery. I just kept getting older, and it got more difficult to see. Till eventually me eyes went, and me arthritis got bad. And so now I'm cleaning up in here. But I can't be really sad. Because you see, I feel that life's a game. You sometimes win or lose. And though I may be down right now, at least I don't work for Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. It's like just racism coming out of the blue. You know, winning your audience over. They're just some totally extraneous racism just suddenly. Just his head. I love this drift across to Eric. As for me, if you want to know what I think, I'll show you something. Come with me. <laughs> So don't forget, it's still one take from the, uh, from the start of the cleaning lady giving her life story. Come on, don't be shy. The grand entrance. Mind the stairs, all right? An age of civic architecture. That doesn't exist anymore, really. I think this will help explain. And then we go out into the street. Come along, come along. Over here. The editor on, put on this on. nice car squeal. <laughs> More interesting. This way. Well, I think this is where the film ran out, so we had come to do on. a little mix. This way. Stay by me, huh? So you can imagine this is at the end of the film. I think it would be really good. It's, Eric did this so well. It's just this magical place and this cottage just set in a, in a park and there was no road to it and no nothing. And there were pigeons sitting on the roof. You can't actually see them on this DVD. My mother, she put me on her knee and she said to me, Gaston, my son, the world is a beautiful place. You must go into it and love everyone. Try to make everyone happy and bring peace and contentment everywhere you go. And so I became a waiter. It's, it's not much of a philosophy, I know. But 
well. Yeah, there are the pigeons. You can see them there. You. The doves. I can live my own life in my own way if I want to. Fuck off. Don't come following me. The Meaning of Life, Part 7. Death. Strange burying somebody on the beach. <laughs> This man is about to die. In a few moments now, he will be killed. For Arthur Jarrett is a convicted criminal who has been allowed to choose the manner of his own execution. I mean, the sequence of Graham running and being pursued by uh, bare-chested babes was one of the, the deaths that we had been talking about doing in the version of the film that involved the um, court case and these various executions. And this is one of them. Arthur Charles Herbert Runcy McAdam Jarrett. You have been convicted by 12 good persons and true of the crime of first degree making of gratuitous... It's interesting watching the film because part of the running around sequence takes place in Shad Thames, which was then a derelict area, which became... Uh, oh, God. Sorry, I can't speak anymore. I just need to concentrate on... <laughs> On the images. Oh, and these lovely girls. They were so beautiful. All of them. They were just so lovely. I think I was in love with all of them. Where are these girls now, we ask ourselves? They're just so gay, aren't they? We never got into the <laughs> Freudian uh, interpretation of Graham, a professed homosexual, being pursued by bare-chested women to his death. <laughs> and the way the girls just <laughs> brush their hands off after. This is me, isn't it? Oh, animation. Yeah, in some ways I wish I had done the artwork a little bit better on this. I want to end it all. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. I've always liked the idea, but I still, I still think it works. The uh, mass suicide of autumn. Oh, no. I think if I were to do it again, I might change the artwork and, and, and do a better job. Uh, but I was too busy making a live-action short film. Mommy! So I had to bring in Daddy. some friends to do the artwork. Mommy! It's a lot of leaves to make. <laughs> it's the timing, of course. It's so wonderful. It was interesting, and I really had to bring in more help than normal on, on the animation. Uh, and so even when you see the figure of the, uh, the Grim Reaper rising up out of the grave, that's proper animation. And so I had to bring in truly talented, uh, experienced people for a change. Now for this next sequence, um, for some reason I insisted on John being death here, and it was so cold that rain was horizontal. And John was, and I thought, well... It has to be John, because he's such a distinguished shape. Of course, it could be anybody, actually. But John was standing there. And instead of being furious, he was actually laughing, because he said it was so awful. Just thought it was so cold. Yes? Is it about the head? I'm awfully sorry. I am the Grim Reaper. Who? The Grim Reaper. Yes, I see. I am dead. Yes, well, the thing is, we've got some people from America for dinner tonight. Who is he, darling? It's a Mr. Death or something. He's come about the reaping. I don't think we need any at the moment. Hello. But do leave him hanging around outside, darling. Ask him in. Darling, I don't think it's quite the moment. Do come in. Come along in. Come and have a drink. Do. Come on. Have a drink. It's one of the little men from the village. Do oh. come in, please. This is Howard Katzenberg from Philadelphia. And his wife, Debbie. Hello there. And these are the Portland Smiles, Jeremy and Fiona. Good evening. This is Mr. Death.
Well, do get Mr. Death a drink, darling. Uh, yes. Mm. Mr. Death is a reaper. Darling, reaper. Hardly surprising in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still a reaper out here, do you, Mr. Death? I always find it very strange playing the American, having to try to do an American accent. It's harder than you think, especially when I've got one. We were just talking about some of the awful problems facing the third guy. Michael is very attractive, isn't he? Eric, though, of course, is the babe. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any beer. <laughs> Terry's always just such an old tart. <laughs> I am not of this. In order for him to be able to walk into the middle of the table, it was very simple. We just had the table cut away so he could walk into the middle of it. Because not sure that Mike's character is just such a wonderful lady. Well, isn't that extraordinary? We were just talking about death. It's the only time I got to play a sort of, you know, like a halfway sexy woman. I mean, not particularly about blousy, but it's, a, it's very odd directing when I was dressed in the silk dress and made up. Ah, no. Obviously not. Well, let me just tell you something, Mr. Death. You don't. Just one moment. I'd like to express on behalf of everybody here what a really unique experience this is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're so delighted that you dropped in, Mr. Death. Can I just finish, please? Mr. Death, is there an afterlife? <laughs> <laughs> Mike's expression there, the one who's asked the right <laughs> question, you <laughs> know, is unsatisfaction. Can I just say this at this time, please? Silence! I have come for you. You mean to take you away? That is my purpose. The extraordinary thing about John, who is inside there, it's not just John Cleese's voice, he is death. He seemed to be the most comfortable, the most happy I've ever seen him inside this, this, this sack of stuff. Because he had to manipulate this hand, which uh, he had some sort of controls. But he just found himself on another temporal plane when he was in there. And um, maybe, I don't know what John gets up to at home. Maybe he does this sort of thing at night, puts on shrouds and pretends to be death. Dead. All of us. All of you. I thought it was the most thankless task of being inside there because anybody could have done it. But John was uh, wanting to do He wanted to do it. He insisted. And once he was in there, he didn't yes, want to come out. Oh, oh, quiet. Englishman, you're all so fucking pompous. None of you have got any balls. Can I ask you a question? What? How can we all have died at the same time? Mm, she asked the right question again. <laughs> Clever one, is he? One of the great moments when he points to... The Salmon Moose. The Salmon Moose. Darling, you didn't use canned salmon, did you? John was rather pleased with the articulated finger. That he could, he had it on that little handle. If you squeeze the handle, it articulated the finger. That's what John loved doing, that finger. Look at that. <laughs> I think the great thing about John doing it is his timing is exquisite. And probably if one had got a performer in there, they wouldn't have moved or their timing wouldn't have been uh, as good. I mean, it's like when we did Holy Grail and John was the Black Knight, once again inside of a black space that nobody could see it was him. And he loved it. No. Come. This bunger promised me to have some fresh salmon. He's not always so reliable. Can we get our glasses? No, mm. good idea. Mike's great improvised line here. Hey, I can meet the moose. <laughs> Which wasn't in the script, it's one of the few bits of improvisation. Honestly, darling, I'm so uh, strange looking house, I'm not sure what it was meant to be. It's on the Yorkshire Moors. Shall we take our cars? Why not? Yes, why not? Good idea. Why not? Shall we go of yeah, the death party getting into their cars. 
in far too bourgeois. So then you have the ghost cars. Great tunnel towards the light. That's just done with about three or four layers that I just kept turning on themselves and, and mixing it together. It worked. Cheap, but effective. Behold, paradise. <laughs> paradise is a Holiday Inn. Well, would you believe it? <laughs> Hello. Welcome to heaven. Excuse me, could you just sign here, please, sir? Thank you. There's a table for you through there in the restaurant. Yeah. For the ladies. Yeah. Off to life mints. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Oh, is it Christmas today? Of course, madam. It's Christmas every day in heaven. Oh, mm. how about that? Lovely. <laughs> and the idea here was the kind of like a walk down that we see people from various different parts in the film. All the kids there for every sperm is sacred, the Zulu Wars people, the girls, uh, first world war characters. It's going to be a show. I just love the idea of it being this sort of 1930s kitsch the orchestra coming up on a Praise, and there's this huge stairway. And... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly a real honorable experience to be here this evening. A very wonderful and warm and emotional moment for all of us. And I'd like to sing a song for all of you. It's Christmas in heaven. All the children sing. <laughs> the angels, of course, they've all got false breasts, of course. They, they were a bit... A little quasi <laughs> oh, the angels there. The girls would want to uh, show their own breasts, but they didn't mind her. This was one of those expensive shots that we had to make a swimming pool. I love these female Santa Clauses with exposed bosoms. This was a very complex shot with the TV here. And again, it'd be easy to do now, but it's very complex with the... We yeah, go into this other TV as well, so we've got several things working once. There's gifts for all the family. There's toilets and trains. Yes, sorry, Walkman headphone sets. And the latest video games. It was just sort of a nightmare. The girls treading on the uh, lights because they were if they trod on the light. We'd have to start the whole thing again. And, where, and then there's a ride. The girls being flown. And where on earth can the sequence go from here? They get switched off. Well, that's the end of the film. Now here's the meaning of life. Thank you, Brigitte. <clears throat> well, it's nothing very special. Uh, try and be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in, and try and live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations. And finally, here are some completely gratuitous pictures of penises. The sequence seems a bit old-fashioned now, because uh, pictures of penises and things don't mean anything now, but this was made in 1982-83. It seems kind of relevant then, but... Things changed in the 80s and 90s. Are being stabbed with knitting needles by gay presidential candidates, vigilante groups strangling chickens, armed bands of theatre critics exterminating mutant goats. Where's the fun in pictures? Oh, well, there we are. Here's the theme music. Good night. It ends with the television set. John. <laughs> And Eric's wonderful song. On a planet that's evolving and revolving at 900 miles an hour. And there it is. The meaning of life. Simon Jones, Patricia Quinn, Carol Cleveland, Judy Lowe, Andrew McLaughlin, Mark Rhodes, Valerie Whittington.
The sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see are moving at a million miles a day. In an outer spiral arm at 40,000 miles an hour of the galaxy we call the Milky Way. Our galaxy itself contains a hundred billion stars. It's a hundred thousand light years side to side. It bulges in the middle, 16,000 light years thick, but out by us it's just 3,000 light years wide. We're 30,000 light years from galactic central point. We go round every 200 million years. And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in this amazing and expanding universe. Expanding and expanding in all of the directions it can whiz. As fast as it can go, at the speed of light you know. 12 million miles a minute and that's the fastest speed there is. So remember when you're feeling very small and insecure. How amazingly unlikely is your birth. And pray that there's intelligent life somewhere up in space. Cause there's bugger all down here on Earth. 